Yeah. Okay. Well, it is a pleasure to have uh, uh, here, uh, albeit virtually, uh, Sanal Muhan. Uh, to discuss the situation uh, surrounding the COVID pandemic, the political and social consequences of the COVID pandemic uh, in India in general, but also in particular in Kerala, uh, where he is based. Uh, and as part of this, uh, this series of interviews we're doing about people-centered responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to learning from, from you. Uh, uh, in this discussion. So let's just begin by, let me ask you a little bit about what the situation is, uh, how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, people's lives, their ex the experiences on the ground uh, uh, in India in general. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's a wonderful occasion to get back to you and also to be part of the larger conversation. Now, uh, coming to the situation in India, uh, today's statistics says that the uh, total cases have gone up to 300,147. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, uh, statistics we have. And uh, there is a recovery rate of uh, 149,759. Mm. And the death toll up to today is 8,551. This is the uh, bare statistics. But uh, given the uh, enormous numbers of population of India, this might appear as small, but it is not small in terms of its reach because uh, most observers within India as well as abroad have pointed out that the rate of testing is very, very low compared to the extent of the population or the density of population, et cetera. And therefore it has become absolutely impossible for anybody, even the experts in epidemiology and other you know, specialized fields of inquiry as far as coronavirus, COVID-19 is concerned. All of them agree to the fact that these statistics are in certain ways, highly underestimated kind of strategies that we have. But obviously we have to depend on that to uh, make sense of it. Now, uh, across the country, if you take, as uh, the diversity is uh, so huge, uh, we find states where, you know, especially, uh, for example, a state like Manipur in the Northeast of the country, uh, the percentage could be much less. I know the occurrences could be less or in the islands of Andaman and Nicobar, there will be very few cases or not even, you know, very uh, cases which are noticeable. Uh, but when you come to uh, more populous states like Maharashtra, then the situation is very bad. So it is something like 97,648 today's statistics. And uh, fortunately, there is a recovery of 46,078 people. And obviously, the death rate is 3,590. So we have across the country, you know, such staggering statistics. In the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, neighboring to Kerala, mm. uh, today's statistics is 40,698 cases. And recovery, fortunately, is uh, 22,047 and that's 367. So it is uh, going up in a way. And the National Capital Territory of Delhi has also recorded large numbers of cases. So it's the case with uh, West Bengal, Odisha, and so many other states of the North. And uh, so therefore I think uh, the situation is uh, uh, really bad. Uh, so, I checked uh, today's uh, case in Kerala, for example, on an average, I think it is uh, close to 60 cases of COVID-19 infection uh, mm. in the last few days. Mm. And, uh, you know, up uh, 218,949 uh, people are quarantined in Kerala now. Mm. Uh, but active cases are 1,922. Mm. So 
231 people are in hospital undergoing treatment. So now as far as Kerala is concerned, this statistics is obviously, I cannot say, you know, it is promising or anything of that kind, but it's very scary. But the saving grace is that, uh, you know, the uh, cases have not spread as much as cities in other parts of, in many other parts of the country. Mm. Now that's the, the reason for that uh, is that uh, in 2018, uh, especially the northern Calicut district of Kerala had uh, the spread of Nipah virus, mm. which was a very scary thing. And fortunately, it was confined to a particular county uh, close to the city of Cal not very far from the city of Calicut. Mm. Now, that time, the Department of Health Service of the government of Kerala worked quite actively in containing. So they had exactly the same kind of strategies which are adopted today, you know, testing, isolation, you know, treatment and so on. So they identified the sources of the virus, Nipah, and then isolated the case, uh, the areas, then uh, took care of the people who were affected and then, you know, they were treated. Exactly the same kind of uh, uh, idea actually worked this time as well because uh, it was the first case in Kerala was reported on the 30th of January. Mm. So these are actually the case of the students who had returned from Wuhan. So they were uh, enrolled in medical schools in China, in the Wuhan province. Mm. And once the outbreak started there, uh, so they uh, came back to Kerala. Mm. And then uh, the health department and also the minister in charge of that uh, Ms. K.K. Uh, Shailaja, she is the minister in charge of that. And her colleagues in the health department, they actually activated the same strategy which was used during the Nipah times. And there was a very uh, significant preparation of uh, to identify the people who were affected by this as and when they reached uh, the international airports, then they were, uh, you know, taken to uh, a specific uh, hospitals which were earmarked for the treatment of the COVID-18 and so on. So there was, sorry, COVID-19, there was a lot of uh, preparation that way. And then uh, uh, those who were affected, they were admitted in uh, hospitals and they were treated and, uh, you know, so from January uh, through February, March, you know, the, the number of cases were very, very minimal. Mm. And uh, it was also confined to those who had come from outside, like the the students who had come from Wuhan and so on. But now what happens is that uh, the situation has changed a little bit, uh, which is very scary in the sense that now after the lockdowns, uh, you know, thousands of people have started pouring into the state from rest of India as well as from abroad. Mm. And, uh, you know, there are thousands of people uh, who come to the international airports and so on. And uh, they are uh, actually uh, you know, identified at the airport itself and then taken uh, to the uh, destination, which are COVID-19 hospitals. And uh, they were given specialized treatment and so on. Uh, but there are cases in which... Uh, you know, the health workers, the uh, paramedic staff and so on. Some of them uh, contracted virus from the affected people as they were treating this mm. uh, COVID-19 patients or they were taking care of them as health workers and so on. And therefore, uh, one of these uh, most, uh, you know, threatening situation now is uh, the sort of contact Trans, the transmission through contact, not exactly the original infection which is coming from outside the state within India or from abroad, but within uh, Kerala, mm. we find uh, some kind of spread which is happening. Mm. Uh, so therefore, uh, I guess here two things are really significant. One of which is to talk about uh, those who have come from abroad uh, and those who have come from the rest of India. But otherwise, uh, if, from, if you look at from the 
uh, early phase of uh, the return of uh, COVID-19 affected people to the state on 30th of January till today. Uh, things were uh, in, in certain ways not that bad. But now in the last, uh, say, 15 to 20 days, uh, things have changed. And so it is scary now because of that. Uh, so therefore, we should, uh, I think uh, when it comes to uh, looking at Kerala's case, we need to identify these different phases. And of course, that again goes along with the, uh, the lockdown, which was uh, introduced in Kerala. Mm. In fact, uh, I guess uh, nearly uh, two weeks before it was introduced in uh, the rest of the country. So mm. in India, it was, I think, on 24th of March. So at least seven days before that, uh, we had undergone a situation similar to that of uh, lockdown in the state. Mm. So that uh, probably helped the uh, help to arrest the spread of this. Mm. But now, uh, when it comes to rest of the country and you know the forest uh, state boundaries, people crossing over and so on. Yeah, uh, things have become really difficult. I guess mm. I have uh, dealt with this yeah. particular scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, could you say a little bit more, maybe, about uh, uh, how people have themselves have uh, uh, responded to the situation in terms of how they survive under lockdown, what people's experiences yeah. under lockdown are, what the added, uh, how much fear or uh, solidarity there is at the at the level of uh, uh, of ordinary people. Yeah, so uh, that's a, uh, I mean, a, a great question. So we should start with the ordinary folks. Now, uh, for the ordinary people, people, especially those who are wage earners, you know, uh, those who are small-time vendors, you know, uh, those who sell vegetables in the market, those who sell fruits uh, mm. on the street sides, or those who sell small textile uh, shops and you know these are the kind of uh, what we call as uh, unorganized sector people yeah mm. uh, so they had a real difficult time because during the lockdown they had to shut down all their economic activities uh, but fortunately much before the government of india had come out with this uh, uh, covid-19 package uh, so the the latest being Something like uh, 307.65 billion US dollars. That's a kind of package, uh, which uh, everybody would say that, uh, in fact, is nothing that compared to the kind of worries that people had, economic uh, problems that people had been uh, undergoing. This amount was not much, but uh, much before uh, the government of India proclaimed uh, this sort of uh, economic assistance, this government in Kerala uh, uh, did proclaim that it would come out with uh, a tranche of economic assistance to the people. And uh, so the idea was that to support uh, people who have lost their jobs, who are out of work, and uh, especially you know, uh, those in the unorganized sector, daily wage earning, both in the cities as well as in the rural areas. The government had come out with a very substantial kind of help. Now, uh, because of that, uh, it's, I mean, if we uh, talk about this, you know, one of which is to refer to the fact that many of these uh, welfare a sort of uh, economic assistance which used to be there. Uh, they appended that and also uh, suggested that they, uh, the government would enhance the amount of money which is paid and so on. So mm. therefore on an average, uh, let's say people would uh, get uh, something like $80 uh, per month. Mm. I mean, uh, these are for uh, people who used to receive welfare pensions. Mm. The amount used to be much uh, less before, but they had enhanced it. So if you translate this, it would come up to something like $80 uh, dollars per month. Mm. Uh, obviously, given the kind of constraints that people have been suffering, it was not much. But then there was something to fall back upon. Uh, mm. So therefore, within Kerala, 
uh, much before uh, the similar kind of assistances were uh, uh, proclaimed across the country. So there was some kind of uh, economic assistance coming to people. That's one thing. And secondly, uh, Kerala, there is a uh, huge number of uh, workers in working in almost all sectors of the economy, uh, from rural agricultural sector to construction sector in the cities, in small restaurants, or wherever there is some work, you find uh, people from uh, mostly from the eastern states of India, not as well as the northeastern states. Mm. So some of the political economists who studied this have uh, calculated that uh, there is uh, little over, uh, say, three million uh, workers of uh, workers in Kerala from the northeastern and eastern parts of India, mm. and these people were already uh, living in you know. I would say that uh, the conditions of living were very, very bad, even before the uh, COVID lockdown and all that, because you find uh, 10 people uh, being you know, put in a small room and mm. they would be there just to sleep. Uh, but in the morning, they go out for work and in the evening, they come back. So therefore, there are so many people who were uh, huddled, who used to be huddled in such... Uh, Mm. you know, small quarters, and which has been there, uh, I think, in the last uh, more than 10 years, this uh, phenomenon in a very big way uh, happening in Kerala. Mm. And now with lockdown, what would happen is that all these daily wage earning people will have to stay within these small rooms, uh, which obviously cannot contain so many people. Mm. So if 10 people in a small room and uh, they may not have enough water, they may not have uh, you know, adequate toilet facilities and so on. And then during the early phase of the lockdown and uh, you know, when the situation was observed as uh, really bad, uh, I think even before that, even during the early days of the lockdown in Kerala, the government announced uh, you know, this welfare measures like opening up uh, kitchens for people. So there were uh, uh, thousands of that sort of, you know, uh, eateries opened mm. up by the state to cater to the requirements of the standard people. Uh, so from the northern districts of Kasargo down to Trivandrum, which is the state capital, we have had several such uh, kitchens which are opened by uh, the local self-government agencies, and uh, it was also supported by the women's self-help group, uh, which in uh, which is uh, named as Kudumbasri. Uh, uh, That's a name in Malayalam for that. Mm. Uh, basically, uh, we would say that uh, we should observe that there was a, the initiative of the local self-government, and they used their funds, and they also got some allotment from this government of Kerala. And then, uh, you know, the volunteers of the uh, self-help groups would help. And there will be uh, people who are ready to help in preparing food and so on. And uh, these are volunteers who mm. would register their names with uh, one government portal, which is uh, in Malayalam uh, referred to as Sanyadham, uh, which is... Uh, that's a uh, voluntary, uh, you know, a service. So one could uh, register there and be part of that. The idea was that, uh, you know, one shouldn't bring in uh, the sort of politics which can be very divisive and uh, very much, uh, you know, counterproductive on this sort of occasions. So therefore, mm. the government was uh, really concerned about it. And they said, well, uh, people could come and help. So they have to register as a volunteer and work along with this. And they were given kind of instructions uh, about what to do, what not to do, and all that. Mm. And therefore, across the state, uh, there were thousands of people who were ready to uh, help the initiatives. Mm. And once if a place is uh, you know, really declared as a red zone area, if there is a COVID case, 
uh, then that area will be locked down. That particular segment of the village or uh, the city or town will be under lock. And then these volunteers would, uh, they give their, uh, you know, sort of uh, helpline numbers and so on. And those who require medicines, those who require their everyday grocery and so on, they could uh, call the volunteers and, uh, you know, get the necessary things. And they pay for that. Uh, only the kind of uh, amount of money, which is, the, I mean, uh, which is the cost of the provisions that would uh, that would be, you know, supplied. Mm. And this was uh, really voluntary. And therefore, we have this voluntary work as part of uh, the popular initiative. And then this uh, community kitchen, which was run. And uh, there was another problem because this. Uh, people from the northeastern and eastern district sorry states of india they didn't like the kind of food which is <laughs> normally yeah. served in kerala yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these uh, food cultures are so diverse in india as you yeah. know very well yeah. and therefore what will happen is that they would refuse to uh, partake in the cooked meals so for such people uh, the provisions would be supplied like the cereals pulses and other vegetables will be supplied to them. And all of these are free of cost. And the government spent a lot of money to protect these people. And in fact, it was even uh, today now, uh, since this migrant labor problem became a real humanitarian crisis in India. Uh, I have read newspaper articles where scholars and other journalists were saying that what Kerala had done was good. Uh, I mean, in fact, uh, some of, uh, when in private conversations, even in my own uh, home, when I discuss this with my family members, they would say that, well, why these migrant people who are being taken care of here want to go? And I'm saying that this is the whole question about where you should be in a crisis situation, in a pandemic situation, where one would like to be. Mm. Uh, it is uh, the whole meaning of what... Uh, the private space of home is all about. Mm. You don't want to be huddled together in a room where you have 10 to 12 people. Mm. And that's not the, uh, I mean, in fact, uh, the lockdown had created such a huge human misery, in fact, where mm. people were really wanting to escape, but they cannot go out. Once they uh, come out, the people will call police, the other, you know, the uh, local people would uh, call out to the police, they will put, these people are notice, and the police will come. And there were several instances, even in Kerala, uh, this migrant level is being uh, you know, uh, given a rough deal by the police. They were beaten up. And even uh, there were cases when the local people came out and uh, started beating up these people. Mm. Uh, so mm. therefore, I think uh, this is uh, one problem. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, I can thank hear you. you. Yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, when, I, when we I look at the whole scene from below, uh, so the migrant laborers problem is very huge. And the government of Kerala wanted to uh, show that, okay, we are, you are part of us. You are not alien to the Kerala society. And meanwhile, they introduced a new terminology to refer to this. this uh, earlier, they would be referred to as migrant workers. Uh, and then mm -hmm. subsequently, Officially, they would be referred to as guest workers. So in Malayalam, we will call it as Aditi Thorilali. Thorilali mm. is a worker. Aditi is a guest. So it's to show that there is certain kind of intimacy being, you know, uh, yeah. uh, there and which, is, uh, which will take care of the problems of these people. But uh, things were not that simple. As I said about the whole idea of home, the, mm. I elsewhere when I was asked to talk uh, write about it, I said the, it was a situation of a great fear. You know, you never know what will happen to you, and then even if you uh, that person is offered money, food, and so on, then this uh, you know this mad craving to get back home and mm. to be with your own people uh, mm. that was a very very fundamental thing. And unfortunately, on many occasions, this was treated as a law and order problem. Mm. So if I tell my own people here in my home that, well, this is not a law and order problem, it has something to do with uh, you know, the mentality of people, their desire, their anxieties, all of this emotional stuff which has been there. And uh, the great fear as well. So therefore, uh, 
from below when uh, we approach this, I think uh, the condition of migrant workers, in spite of the support given by the state government in Kerala, uh, that was uh, really uh, difficult mm. in the sense that the people wanted to go. And now uh, thousands of people have left. Or in fact, uh, the statistics is so staggering. In fact, millions of uh, standard workers uh, have left the, their places of work uh, for their home state. But unfortunately, uh, by the time they reach their home state, already COVID-19 began to spread. Mm -hmm. And then they were not welcome in their home villages or small towns. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were hundreds and thousands of occasions when these people were turned down from their own villages. The, even the family members said, you guys have brought in this uh, deadly mm. virus uh, and that you cannot meet us until you have spent uh, 14 days of uh, quarantine. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, the people who thought that they would reach home and uh, naturally not many have reached. Mm. And probably it will take a long time for them to come out of this quarantine and reach mm. uh, their own places. Mm. And the other thing uh, with regard to the, uh, the conditions of the ordinary folks, yeah. uh, we need to pay attention to the daily wage earners who had to live without work for a long time. And therefore, uh, what would happen is that uh, the people were reduced to taking a kind of charity from the state. Although it is not charity in that sense, because they are entitled to uh, get that. Mm. But this whole idea of entitlement uh, and citizenship had to be brought in uh, to create a situation where people would receive support of it without compromising on their idea of their human worth and so on. But unfortunately, uh, this has happened in India. But this is contrary to what uh, all the governments would say. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a huge deficit. No, it's not deficit. Uh, sometimes it's an absolute lack of an idea of citizenship mm -hmm. where you really want to look at these people, the suffering people as uh, humans. Now, uh, my last point in relation to this is that if you compare this with uh, the conditions of the middle class mm -hmm. uh, across the country, including Kerala, uh, where people have uh, proper houses, where one could have uh, the... Uh, sort of social distancing. I don't like that term because it brings in the whole idea of caste uh, yeah. which are created these horrible histories of mm. exploitation, distancing, etc. in India. Mm. And therefore, whatever physical distancing uh, which we are able to practice, uh, middle class, upper middle class and so on. And also the sheer availability of water to wash your hands. Yeah. So uh, I read some on, in some newspaper articles that there are more than 50 uh, million people, yeah? or even more, uh, who would not have uh, uh, water for this frequent uh, hand washing and so on. Mm. So therefore, let us imagine that in a populous country like India, there could be more people who may not have access to water. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so even uh, there are horrible stories of people who were given uh, a few kilograms of rice and some pulses. But uh, you cannot, uh, you know, make uh, cooked food out of that. You need uh, at least, because all over India, people prepare curry, you know about that. Mm. And it's all sort of condiments. You cannot make uh, something of that kind without this. Mm. So therefore, uh, I guess, except the middle classes and the upper classes in India, people really suffered uh, during this lockdown. Mm. Mm. And uh, if ever we want to write a history of this, uh, obviously we need to look from below to see what were their experience and the conditions of women and children. So there was uh, things have been noted in terms of uh, everyday violence within the households, uh, terrible men and folks, you know, beating up women. So all of these have been reported. But then the question of gender has not uh, come up the way it should have been. And there are many instances reported from all over India where, uh, in the context of this uh, so-called social distancing, caste violence erupted, killing people. Uh, mm. The upper caste never wanting to go along with the uh, Dalits or other backward castes. 
So therefore, we have this uh, whole, you know, pandemic uh, situation bringing forth the old, uh, you know, rivalries of caste and gender in a big way. Mm. But I'm not sure uh, how far it has been uh, reported in the mainstream media. Uh, but some of our friends in other parts of India who are, uh, you know, social scientists, they have written about uh, the problematic of the social distancing, caste, and so on. Mm. And uh, the other one is about children. And uh, as you know very well, India has had this huge problem of child labor. And in fact, uh, in one case, uh, you know, one of these girls, her name, I guess, is Jumla. She had uh, to travel by foot around uh, 200 kilometers to reach her hometown in Jharkhand, home village in Jharkhand. So she has been traveling, walking along with elders, but something like 68 kilometers before she would re she uh, mm. reached her home village she fainted and uh, she fell down and died. Mm. So it was because she was young, she couldn't uh, bear this uh, walk in the scorching sun and so on. Because in, the, in that part of the country, it is a monsoon. Obviously, all, most parts of India, it is uh, summer. Some places uh, actually receive some uh, summer rains and so on. I mean, Kerala monsoon is setting off. Uh, but mm. during this time, when this girl was walking from Andhra Pradesh to Jharkhand, that area, uh, you know, the condition was very bad and she died. So there are many cases of people getting killed on their way to, you know, reach home. So it's like uh, the whole, you know, the South American caravan. The situation mm. was really bad here. That was a crossing across the national boundary. So within the state, within India, when people move, uh, they are intimidated by police of all states. That is the scary part of that. Those who are, mm. you know, uh, really trying to escape from the pandemic situation in their workstations, as they walk through different states, they would encounter the stiff resist resist resistance is not the right word there. They would be physically tortured by the police. They want to be, uh, they want these people to be sent back to uh, their uh, workplace or wherever they are, wherever they live. Because they think the police had this whole idea as instructed by the state government that these people would be carrying and spreading uh, coronavirus, mm. COVID-19. Mm. And therefore they are to be sent back or they should be kept uh, kept in you know, quarantine. Mm. Uh, but uh, we know from all the newspaper reports that they lacked food, they lacked water. And this was not even noticed by you know, the Supreme Court, in spite of the fact that uh, many well-meaning, uh, you know, uh, uh, advocates of Supreme Court uh, who were known for their commitment to the poor, who would do this, uh, what we call this uh, public interest litigation. In spite of their raising this question there, there was no solution until last week, then uh, this, you know, kind of Required kind of situation, and the Supreme Court suddenly, you know, uh, woke up from its uh, slumber and mm. they realized that something is happening. So, so this was uh, a situation where the government failed, the court failed, and almost all agencies who should have been really safeguarding the lives of the poor people, working people, they all failed. In fact, the question that you raised, you know, what happens in this situation? So the whole uh, facilities in Indian cities and small towns and all the urban areas have been built up by these people, you know, sweating uh, their blood. Now, when in the pandemic situation, uh, except a few state governments, none of them showed any mercy to these people. Mm. And therefore, I think uh, this social suffering, which has been created by India, in fact, is, uh, you know, something and parallel in, in, in Indian history. I don't mm. think, obviously, this uh, COVID-19 is unparalleled historically, but then I don't think even during colonial times, people would have suffered these kinds of things. Mm. Uh, so therefore, we need to really look at this as we are looking at the politics and the experiences of people from below. So we need to really... Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, thank you for that uh, ex rather exhaustive uh, discussion uh, going over oh, a, 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 a very yeah. systematic uh, answer to my question. Let's shift focus a little bit, though, uh, and talk uh, about uh, the political uh, turbulence and the way in which the political and social turbulence caused uh, by the pandemic has been uh, manipulated by uh, people in power, in particular by Modi and his government, some, some of the politics uh, uh, yeah. of, uh, uh, of, uh, from the top, let's say, from the top down now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, in this particular uh, context, we really need to talk about the politics because it's all uh, built into one. And in fact, uh, during the early phase of uh, the pandemic, early January and so on, when there was time, uh, uh, you know, that was a time when uh, uh, Donald Trump was visiting India. So the uh, whole uh, machinery of the central government was focused on that. Uh, and a lot of people have written about it. Uh, mm. So uh, Trump was visiting uh, Ahmedabad, that is, uh, you know, Modi's home turf. And then subsequently, he would go to Delhi. And in Delhi, so remember, we had this, uh, you know, fantastic mobilization against uh, Citizenship Act, uh, yeah. uh, which was introduced by the central government sometime in the early week of uh, December 2019. Yeah. And there was a huge buildup across the country. Uh, in most parts of the country, there were protest move, uh, movements, you know. Uh, that was a kind of social movement in that sense where we had uh, ordinary folk, especially women, uh, came to the fore and they took up leadership. And uh, there were a lot of places in Delhi where, you know, absolutely great mobilization was taking place. Now, it is in this context that, uh, I mean, larger political context of mobilization against uh, Citizenship Amendment Act uh, of December 2019, uh, that a different kind of politics was unfolding. And in fact, uh, very many progressives or uh, people from the minority communities, especially the Muslims, so, and also uh, even in a state like Kerala, uh, we have a, where we have a very substantial Christian population. Some sections of the church also uh, made public statements against this impending dangers that Citizenship Amendment Act was causing. So therefore, when we look at uh, the uh, political situation just before the outbreak of coronavirus, mm. uh, we find this uh, mobilization of uh, uh, so mobilization against Citizenship Amendment Act as the defining kind of moment. But then uh, the central government's energy was mostly spent on suppressing the movements and also organizing this, uh, this uh, Donald Trump's visit. And then subsequently he comes to Delhi. Then it is uh, early uh, uh, January 2020. And then uh, uh, about the time uh, Donald Trump was uh, leaving India, uh, he left uh, for US from New Delhi. Uh, then uh, what we call the sectarian violence, in Indian English as we refer to as communal violence spread, killing uh, hundreds of uh, people. Mm. And that was the most scary moment. And then uh, what would happen is that in many other uh, parts of Northern India, and especially uh, in the state of Madhya Pradesh, uh, the BJP was involved in toppling the government, the Congress government. So there was a lot of uh, politicking going on uh, in uh, North India and many other parts of the country. So therefore, what would happen is that the governments in such states, as well as at the center, they didn't have uh, enough ideas about how to really you know, uh, think about uh, the impending danger of the coronavirus. Mm. And in fact, by that time, uh, it was almost uh, sure because uh, uh, it, it was uh, already reported from China, Wuhan, and then naturally people thought that there are a lot of Indians who are there in Wuhan province as uh, those who are in business 
or you know students who have gone there so naturally people expected these people to come back mm. but unfortunately in most parts of india uh, i think there was no preparation uh, to deal with this sort of a situation and then uh, the energies were uh, spent uh, more into the sectarian violence and uh, that's a real uh, big tragedy after the 2002 gujarat program and then all the heroes of those prog- program in fact are now in delhi mm. and in fact uh, you know there are a lot of things for you to talk about because delhi had undergone severe violence even before that Uh, mm. for instance the attack on the jawahar lal nehru university which happened mm. much a uh, little uh, before that so therefore we have had a train of uh, similar events whereby uh, with the blessings of those who are in power you know uh, in fact uh, these marauding crowds were unleashing violence and now uh, there was a lack of preparation uh, when this uh, for uh, covid-19 threat was coming because of all this politician mm. and when it came uh, they, and then uh, you know those who, uh, in fact uh, as i said in the beginning we had the first case in kerala of uh, from people who have come back from wuhan and uh, they were given treatment and then uh, subsequently uh, 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 there was a family which had come from italy which uh, i mean obviously people were affected and so on so there are a lot there were a lot of things happening in uh, the mm-hmm. state of kerala at that point of time and the government and the health department was trying to you know uh, identify the people prepare their route map isolate them and so on and then to treat them and finally fortunately they, all of them you know were cured and they were mm-hmm. out of danger and similar preparations were absent at the national level that's why mm. in fact even today uh, i read uh, in the wire uh, the former head of the uh, indian institute of medical sciences in new delhi saying that in uh, he, according to him uh, india should have followed the uh, example set in by kerala uh, mm. had it been doing that the situation would have been really different now uh see uh this uh, uh, you know the if you look at the current uh, statistics i think uh, india's infection is fourth uh, among mm. the uh, countries of the world mm. and uh, which is even after uh, one of the most severe lockdown which is practiced mm. since uh, uh 24th of uh, march mm. and this is the uh, stage of the lockdown and uh, mm. we are told that this will be over by uh, thir- 30th of june the lockdown will be lifted now there, there are a lot of uh, i mean uh, some relaxation etc etc but then uh, this relaxation actually comes along with uh, you know rohit come what is happening i'm sorry okay. <laughs> so this relaxation comes along with the huge uh, possibilities of spread now uh, you know so when it comes to the question of politics and i believe there was a, a huge problem across india now for example in the state of west bengal uh, which is a kind of uh, you know what i can say uh, a thorn in the flesh of the bjp government that uh, you know which is uh, the, the west the state of west bengal which is ruled by trinamool congress a non bjp party and the central government uh, obviously do not like it mm. and uh, there is a lot of politics going on there between the government of west bengal and the uh, government of india similarly uh, there was a lot of uh, problems between the state of uh, kerala and the uh, government at the center mm. because the kerala is now under the uh, uh, left hand rule Yeah. you know under the rule of the left parties uh, led by cpim which is mm. one of the communist communist parties in india mm. and uh, which is uh, really opposed by the bjp at the center they want to uh, come up as a big force in kerala but which is not happening and so on mm. and therefore uh, in fact uh, kerala did not receive as much i mean as much help uh compare when it is uh, as much help as compared to you know the rest of the states in india so kerala government mm. is said to get very substantial support from the government of india but 
uh, when the Maharashtra situation became very bad, uh, even this, uh, right, uh, you know, uh, the government over there, which is an amalgam of Congress and uh, it's a coalition of Congress and uh, Shiva Sena, one of those uh, right wing Hindu parties. And that government asked Kerala government to supply uh, paramedics, uh, doctors, and so on. I, mm. I think uh, the government of Kerala sent the a group of paramedics to help them. Mm. So therefore, uh, the politics uh, in India, uh, just before the COVID-19, which was uh, really, uh, for, uh, you know, centering on the question of uh, Citizenship Amendment Act and the violence uh, with which the government uh, opposed, you know, the protesting women in various parts of Delhi, including uh, the Jamia Millia University, just in front of that. So there was a lot of violence happening. And now uh, with uh, this pandemic, what would happen is that uh, the government uh, wanted to really dis I mean, ask the protesting people to go back, but they were not ready to do that. The mm. protesting people remained there and eventually uh, they invoked the provisions of the 2005, I think, uh, Disaster Management Act. Or uh, similar mm. acts which are, which have been, uh, acts which have been passed to deal with the in a pandemic kind of situation, and those acts were invoked to dissolve the, uh, in a group of protesting women. The same thing mm. uh, happened in uh, Jandar Mandir and other places where people were in Delhi. Uh, so therefore, this uh, whole sectarian politics was the one which was uh, being played out. And the other point, uh, which I'm not sure whether it, uh, how much it was being discussed in the international media was the uh, camping of, uh, you know, uh, Tabliki Islami. So there one uh, Islamic religious group uh, which had their place in Nisamuddin in Delhi, you know, the, uh, which is part of the, new, uh, the larger New Delhi. And uh, many uh, people who had come for this program uh, had infection. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually when the lockdown was uh, proclaimed, uh, there were a lot of international delegates. They didn't have enough time to, you know, uh, the, go the government did not give enough time for people to travel or all the international flights were cancelled. Uh, within two days, all the train services were uh, cancelled. I mean, the, if a train starts from New Delhi, it could reach Kerala and it will not go back. So mm. uh, in 48 hours, the whole country came to a standstill. And these people, uh, these Tablighi Islami uh, volunteers, uh, who had COVID. And in fact, subsequently, it was uh, proved that many people had uh, COVID-19 and they could not travel. And then the BJP functionaries and some in the government mm. said all of this was caused by them. And mm. uh, this led to a lot of people across the country believing that uh, COVID-19 was you know, spread by Muslim, this particular Muslim sect. Mm. And there were a uh, few people who had gone from Kerala for their program in Nisamuddin in Delhi. Likewise, from Tamil Nadu and rest of India, you have this uh, whole idea of uh, people going for all these sort of programs. But uh, many of them uh, got infected there because of the fact that they could not uh, move out of that uh, particular enclave. In that, from that multi-story building, they could not go out. Mm. So therefore, what would happen, these uh, right-wing uh, sectarian uh, politicians and political parties of the uh, Hindu right-wing uh, government, so they started propagating all these sort of things. And mm. then by, uh, things have become really bad. And now uh, I think the government of India uh, perhaps is in a fix because in spite of this lockdown, uh, they think that, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be very bad by July. And now th their opinions are divided. For example, uh, many uh, serious epidemiologists who have done extremely good work in this particular area, uh, they would say that the situation in India is very bad. But this is opposed by uh, ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, which is a premier body doing medical research and coordinating research giving research grants, et cetera. So they deny it. Whereas uh, the, you know, the physicians and specialists who are part of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences would say that situation is bad. Uh, sort of community transmission has already set in and so on. So therefore, 
there is a huge denial by the government of india now if you look at uh, cities like uh, chennai in tamil nadu or mumbai in maharashtra or even in kolkata uh, these are the big metro cities of india some some of them in fact including new delhi so the uh, it is really ominous the situation is really bad covid 19 is has been spreading i have just mentioned uh, about the statistics about mm. maharashtra i think uh, Much of the cases uh, from Maharashtra would come from this uh, city of Mumbai. Mm. So, therefore, in spite of the denials of the government, I mean, the government. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I will come to that point uh, soon. In spite of these uh, denials, the truth remains that this is spreading. And now, during the lockdowns, uh, the prime minister came out with uh, fantastic ideas. Uh, it's like you know. So he said, "Well, you guys have to support the medic, uh, paramedics, doctors, and so on." And he encouraged, like uh, for you know, the kind of example of these Italians uh, who came to their balconies and singing mm. and you know, mm-hmm. waving at uh, the medi- paramedics. This guy said, "Well, you guys have to come out uh, for your homes, come to the balcony, and bang your hand. I mean, clap." and then bang you are utensils and all this stuff <laughs> and then what would happen is the, the crazy fellows who were really encouraged by the political leadership they went to the streets and they had their mad political procession banging and you know uh, mm. firecrackers their bursts and it was real uh, mad stuff and this sort of situation uh, happened i guess uh, thrice Mm. and now the whole idea of social distancing was given a go and we do not know how many of those who have participated in that sort of nonsense were really affected by this i hope they are not because mm. we don't want people to undergo this sort of you know severe calamities mm. uh, in mm. spite of they were driven the fact that they were driven by a right wing politics we know that they mm. are human beings and they should not be affected Mm. Uh, so therefore uh, my feeling is that uh, the government of india did not do well this is a fact you check all the writings by uh, you know good economists good sociologists mm. uh, based in india and abroad they all say that well uh, the kind of stuff which the government did was very bad and and the economic front even a person like raghuram rajan who was uh, one time governor of the reserve bank he said well the pmo cannot handle this the prime minister's office cannot handle this they should listen to the opinions of other people they should invite experts i mean we do have a lot of indian economists all over the world and uh, they said uh, invite them listen to them and to plan things accordingly but what has happened uh, in the second modi regime is that they really wanted to go ahead with this divisive sectarian agenda and mm. uh, obviously they cannot listen to same opinions mm. and therefore uh, you see what will happen is that if some if anyone comes with a sort of idea against the government of india they could be branded as anti national and things of that kind mm. and therefore uh, as it has been noted by uh, you know not just leftist scholars or you know people who are left leaning liberal Uh, writers or journalists and so on there is a, a substantial reduction of uh, you know free speech and uh, in addition to that uh, the you know autocratic regimes i mean these are democratic regimes they are not autocratic regimes but they really work as autocratic regimes when mm. it comes to opinions critiquing the policies of the government and therefore this mm. is the larger politics and now look at uh, the schemes announced except uh, this uh, you know this uh, small i mean the schemes for uh, say uh, what we call as uh, medium and small scale business uh, you know uh, units what they call it as medium and uh, small scale business units in india uh, so there are uh, economic packages the banks are encouraged to give loans and for the ordinary folks they promised all the migrant laborers would get money but uh in fact uh, they were not given money mm. so that is the kind of uh, you know idea that we have today when we read all these newspaper articles and research articles that have been published they haven't got enough then mm. uh, who got that is the funny part of the whole thing and there is a huge uh, spree of uh, what we call as disinvestment so all the uh, you know uh, sectors of the economy which have been doing well they are being opened up to 
uh, international capital, private capital, and so on. So therefore, these are not uh, packages meant for relieving the sufferings of the ordinary folks. And on the contrary, it so happened that if you read the uh, government of India's proclamation or the proclamations made by uh, the finance minister, it appears that they were really supporting the capitalist class. And uh, these capitalist class, obviously, they had enough water to wash their hands and you have a better mm. time. Mm. And they did definitely practice social distancing, mm. which they have been doing for uh, last thousands of years in India. Mm. Because the capitalist class are drawn from the upper class in India. Mm. Uh, they mm. have been practicing this distancing absolutely uh, you know, successfully. Mm. And therefore, they are the mm. ones who have gained. And therefore, uh, all the uh, financial uh, packages, economic packages that they have, uh, you know, introduced ultimately are going to help further accumulation of capital, which in mm. fact uh, goes very well with the uh, original statements that you have circulated. What mm. happens to the sort of uh, capitalist kind of development? And yeah. our uh, in current world system, as we see from Indian side, uh, to my mind, what is happening is that this is going to be a really uh, problematic situation where in right-wing politics, sectarian politics, users, uh, capitalism and modern technology to dominate. Mm. And we need really to look at the break, the uh, break up, breaks up of all this across the country to see how this has been happening. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, again, exhaustive, uh, exhaustive, systematic uh, uh, discussion. Um, just uh, we've been talking for quite a while now. Um, yeah. So just to, to end, perhaps uh, on on a on an optimistic note, um, there has been in uh, the United States, in particular, uh, uh, in the context of the pandemic, and then spreading through many places around the globe, uh, a kind of resistance uh, born out of the turbulence of the of. Uh, uh, the the pandemic situation, a resistance and uh, uh, uprising against police brutality and things like this. Yeah, we've seen massive transformations that were just unthinkable uh, even a few weeks ago in terms of yeah. the terrain of public opinion um, in many parts in, in many parts emanating out of uh, uh, in response to this brutal murder murder of George Floyd in the United States. Is there any uh, kind of resonance of of a kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 shaping up of forces from below, moving in a in a progressive direction against uh, this uh, Modi regime uh, in, uh, in the Indian context. Oh, that's a very good question. I, I've been thinking about this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, things are not uh, developing on the ground. Uh, see, mm. what happened is that in the last two elections, twenty fourteen and the most recent election, which put Modi and his uh, men in power, or women in power along with men, mm. uh, we hardly have a, you know oppositional anti-systemic politics developing in India. Yeah. Now there was a, sort of a politics of that kind, and the people who were behind those struggles were from the uh, you know, center to the left sort of people, then the valleys, Adivasis, I mean, and also. Uh, there were there were uh, people's alliances, alliance movements, which took care of problems uh, related to environment, you know, the exploitation of the natural resources, especially mm. during the, uh, let's say, the current phase of neoliberalism, which has been there since the 1990s in India. So therefore, uh, we always thought that, well, there is going to be a, a sort of a rising tide of new social movements. Mm -hmm. And that was there. But unfortunately, what has happened is that that uh, uh, tide has taken a uh, severe setback. Mm -hmm. This is my personal feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not uh, uh, pessimistic in the sense that uh, we still have people across the country because I'm part of some of these uh, networks. So I get this uh, information and so on. People are trying to develop, uh, you know, uh, sort of social movements, uh, you know, which would definitely uh, go against the grain of the current regime at the center. Uh, but the one of the, uh, I think, the mo single most important factor is uh, that 
the sort of Indian middle class. So people in, uh, I mean, the sociologists in India would say, oh, we have a new middle class and stuff for that time. Uh, so these people have been completely sold to this, uh, you know, the Hindutva right-wing agenda and also mm. the neoliberal stuff. And therefore, uh, we really need to uh, think about, uh, you know, the middle classes in India or sections of the middle class in India, uh, which have not been sold to this particular ideology. Now, if you could recall, uh, I give you an uh, example, this, uh, the, that whole business of Howdy Modi in, uh, you know, in the US, mm. uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the expatriate Indians over there invited mm. uh, Modi and they had big mm. uh, Merla mm. over there, big celebration in which Donald Trump himself came and so on. Uh, this is uh, uh, seen as a certain kind of, uh, you know, some people would say that this is the kind of uh, proclamation of the Indian identity, you know. Uh, mm. coming of age and that sort of thing. Now then, today we have this particular situation. Now, what does it mean for uh, progressive people? Is that, even if you, uh, you know, there was a lot of the debates within the US academia, mm. uh, when uh, the question of teaching salvation studies, especially history came. And uh, there were a lot of scholars, uh, you know, especially the center to the left sort of people, uh, who wanted to teach the history of caste and so on in the schools over there in the U.S., where it is not just the uh, Indian, you know, second or third generation Indians, even the American citizens themselves, you know, mm. irrespective of the, of the ethnicities, would learn Indian history uh, in a way that it shows different currents of India, but the sort of Hindutva agenda of the right wing. They wanted just one sort of history to be there. And they mm. were opposed to many of the textbooks uh, which were taught, uh, taught in the universities in uh, US or in the schools over there. Mm. And therefore, I'm bringing this example to show that uh, there is a very vocal, financially powerful section of Indians in the US and uh, uh, in the West. In fact, it, it is very mm. much there in the UK. Mm. And in fact, uh, some of our friends in the Central South Asian Studies are doing research on this, uh, you know, mm. uh, what is called as diasporic Indians and what yeah. sort of stuff they're doing. And therefore, the cultural uh, milieu in which uh, these people used to feel isolated in the Western world, and they feel gratified to the kind of politics that have evolved since 2014 uh, through 2018, 19 in India, mm, mm. and uh, and obviously they get a lot of financial support from uh, you know the people based in there. And in fact, uh, perhaps BJP and its allies or its affiliates or RSS and its affiliates would be getting the largest chunk of money from the Western sources. I mean, mm. those contribution by the Indians based in there or what whoever is contributing, they give a lot of money. And mm. therefore, they have uh, money, power, then their sort of politics, which is evolving here. And what we look forward to is uh, changing uh, kind of politics, which would, uh, which should definitely develop in India, uh, which which has its, uh, you know, environmental sort of thing, you know, mobilization of the indigenous people to preserve their uh, environment against the encroachment of neoliberal industrialists, capitalists, mm. and so on. And therefore, and I think uh, there is a chance of a, a certain kind of uh, larger critique developing and an alternative politics evolving. But unfortunately, uh, that is the most worrying part of it. Uh, we don't have a unified opposition uh, which will, you know, really address this question. Mm. And our liberal opinion uh, is taking a big beat. The universities are under attack. And uh, all, all social scientists, uh, historians, economists, and sociologists who were opposed to this, or even uh, lit uh, literatures, you know, uh, who are opposed to this, uh, really take a big beating now. Mm. Uh, yet, I don't think everything is gone. Uh, mm -hmm. I still believe that the coming together of this critical opinion uh, will definitely move, uh, will uh, bring forward, uh, you know, uh, grassroots politics. But at the moment, with uh, many of the activists uh, who are uh, in jail, 
uh, against whom the government has, uh, you know, filed uh, atrocious, uh, you know, uh, cases. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of them in jail now, and the uh, situation is uh, really bad if, when we look at this from this side. Mm. And then, of course, uh, the you know the human rights situation is uh, definitely very bad with the pandemic and the response of the government. And mm. therefore, uh, for you see, we should look forward to the coming together of whatever uh, you know uh, left politics is surviving in India in various parts of the country and the center to the left kind of political parties mm. coming together on a a particular kind of agenda to restore the uh, Indian constitution, as people would say today. Mm. And mm. that sort of a politics can uh, really bring in uh, change. But uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, not that easy. At the not on the, so not on the really immediate horizon. People. Yeah. Yeah. Not so, on, exactly. Yeah. So I, but I believe that mm. uh, things could change because uh, as a student of history, I do believe that uh, you know autocratic regimes uh, really crumble after a mm. while. They cannot mm. sustain uh, mm. their uh, sway endlessly. So this is mm. the optimism that. I mm. Mm. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much for a very informative discussion. Uh, do you have any last words? Any message you want to get out to, to people who are? Well, Thanks for having me in this conversation. And I believe that uh, definitely uh, given the kind of situation the world over, and I'm sure that uh, internationalism is not dead. Mm. And then uh, as we uh, discussed in 2018 in yeah. Cambridge, you know, uh, one way of uh, capturing uh, this spirit is uh, to have the alliances of people. In fact, uh, that came to my mind when you talk, uh, referred to the situation in the U.S. after mm. George Floyd's tragic killing. In spite of the, uh, loom, uh, the looming uh, threat of pandemic, thousands of people had marched across the cities in the U.S. Mm. I find it as absolutely great. And then we have had the same thing in London, the same thing in yes. Berlin, in many cities in Australia. Uh, mm. Germany and so on. And uh, unfortunately, we never had similar movement in India because uh, in, in spite of the fact that Indians being the uh, biggest uh, racist people, uh, you know, really people <laughs> here do not believe that they are racist mm. because caste is the another form of racism which has mm. had thousands of years of history. Mm. Uh, and therefore, I look, I used to say this in seminars and uh, whatever small things I have, I wrote. And I always believe that uh, you know, there is so much racism inbuilt into India, but it has been normalized. Mm. And therefore, uh, a movement in spite of, uh, you know, there are several locations, even in the last uh, a couple of days ago, a Dalit boy who entered a temple in the temple in UP was shot dead. So mm. you had this everyday violence being per perpetrated against the former untouchable, as we refer to them as Dalits today. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this, I can give a long, uh, you know, mm. kind of history of that. We never had a sustained political movement, uh, you know, which would really challenge caste violence in India. Mm. And uh, in fact, when I, uh, you know, watched the funeral of George Floyd in my room uh, mm. the other day, and I found that, you know, the sort of uh, energy which was being mobilized against racism, Mm. Uh, we really need uh, something similar to that in India uh, to liberate ourselves from the clutches of caste. But it is so much normalized in India that Indians hardly realize that uh, they practice racism. The craze mm. for white skin, which you mm. may not uh, really understand until you reach India and uh, you know look at the people over here. It is really scary. But I look forward to. Uh, social movements uh, that can definitely bring down the autocracies. And uh, uh, well, maybe we are uh, going to have another round of internationalism where, you know, oppressed people on the question of race as these statues are mm. falling now, mm. fortunately. Mm. Uh, one day we will be able to, you know, uh, really talk about the, you know, the rolling down of mighty streams of justice, you know, the kind mm. of stuff yeah. we yeah. all expected. Yeah. So All that's right. what I think. 
yeah yeah there will be more of yeah citizenship and so on justice should that ultimately prevail yeah mm. yeah well yeah. thank you very much for a very interesting conversation um let's definitely stay in touch um yeah and maybe maybe i'll, I'll be in touch with you again to get an update <laughs> Thank you for having me. Great talking to you. Yeah, excellent. You. All right. Um I'll I'll All right.